Okay, so welcome everybody uh, to tonight's program in the uh, 2022 Suzanne Salvestrand Memorial Lecture Series. The movies have played an important role in the whole history of St. Helena for over a hundred years. The first movie venue in St. Helena was the G&G Theater, which was located in the German social club called Turnbrine Hall. Now this Turnbrine Hall was located right where Lyman Park is now. And they later moved downtown to where the cameo presently is. The G&G Theater was named for its owners, uh, Mr. Goodman and Galusi. And those two guys were well-known figures in the history of St. Helena. The St. Helena Star reported that the front drop curtain was gorgeous, had a, a mural of Bale Mill in, in Mount St. Helena, and the lobby had beautiful floors, electrical lights, and they were open every night. That's, I think, pretty amazing. <laughs> so tonight we're going to hear about the evolution of the G&G Theater to its current cameo theater persona. And we're going to hear from the current proprietor of the cameo theater, Miss Kathy Buck. Kathy. Uh, Kathy, you have made so many contributions to our community with your theater as well as other things. And we're so delighted to have you. you bring the history of this beloved theater to life for us tonight. No pressure. Um, okay, thank you so much. It's, it's fun to be here, I have to say. I got nervous for the very first time, and I'm usually not nervous about public speaking. Um, Janice thought that I told her the wrong date because I didn't want her to come. No, it's because I got it mixed up. But it's hard to compete tonight with the Warriors, Top Gun, and COVID. But I want to thank you guys for coming tonight. There is um, some history that I know, some that has been filled in, and when I kind of summarize the last 109 years on May um, 13th, we turned 109 years old, um, it's from stories that people have shared. Um, you can get a little bit in the archives. There's not a lot of footage or um, pictures of the inside of the theater when it was built. There's just a couple of the outside. When it was in Lyman Park, my understanding is that it really wasn't a movie theater. It was um, the nickel um, little boxes that you would crank and see the nickel movies. And that when the theater was actually built on Main Street, that's when it opened with the first silent movie. And the first silent movie that played, this was before talkies, it was May 15th, 1913, uh, was Kings of the Forest. And I think in the beginning it was maybe nine reels and it would have been um, 16 millimeter, I think. Maybe it was different than that, but that's what I think it was. Um, and that, that movie was um, a pretty crazy film and it came from the Seelig Company, which is no longer in business. Um, they were actually run out of business, but they moved, that theater went to California because Thomas Edison, our dear friend who invented the light bulb, tried to monopolize the movie industry. And so a lot of people that wanted to start their own movie studios ended up leaving the East Coast and the Midwest and going to California to get, out of his long, get away from his long reach. And uh, Mr. Selig was kind of a crazy eccentric man much like a lot of us. And he bought a lot of acreage in LA and he collected retired animals. Now these were zoo animals, they were regular animals, and the beginning of his park had what is now the MGM lions. Those stone lions that are at MGM were actually his. And he created um, a lot of silent films. There, there are a few still left in LA in the Film um, Historical Society, but Kings of the Forest, when we were going to turn 100 years old, um, we found out what movie was playing and we wanted to see if we could get a copy of it. And um, in the US, there was not a copy. 
But you know, the cameos always had magic around it. And a few years earlier, we had had a family that was traveling through and um, he was a film historian from the Netherlands, Egbert. And um, so I sent him an email and I said, this, this movie played, is there anybody in your outreach all through Europe that might have a copy of it? Lo and behold, you're not gonna believe it, but yes, there was a copy left and it was in the Netherlands, but the last few reels were burned off. I think it was originally probably about 35 minutes. Um, today, what we have is about 12 minutes because um, the film caught on fire and anyway. Anyway, he said, well, we'll ship it to you. I said, oh, no, 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 no. Please, can somebody convert it to a, a DVD format and send it to us? And it had um, the cards, but they were all in Dutch. So we sent it to a company in um, Napa and they translated it and put it back together again with English cards. And at that time I said, well, I want to do the silent movie again for the cameo with someone that's playing live. And of course, the, the mu there wasn't any music to this movie. So I asked um, the late Ray Manzarek, and some of you may know him, he was the keyboard player for The Doors. And Ray and his wife came to the cameo once in a while. I know this is a long story, but I'll speed it up after that. It's pretty fascinating. And I asked him if he would please write the score for Kings of the Forest silent film for our 100th birthday. He said, no. I said, wait a minute. Who's ever in your life going to ask you to do this? And he said, all right. So I went, oh, God, now we're going to have an original score by the keyboard player from the doors, and he's going to play for the silent movie. As time went on, just before, about two weeks before, um, he called and he said, I'm sorry, Kathy, death trumps your show. And he had been diagnosed with cancer and he hadn't finished it, he was close, um, but he passed away on May 20th. But our own local Mike Greensill stepped in, he brought his organ, and he had got to watch the DVD a little before, and for, before the audience, and we played it a couple of times, he created a score with his organ and played it so that people got the full experience of a silent film. And I think it's really fascinating that those things happened and the magic of the cameo keeps on going. So we were able for that year, leading up to the 100th birthday, we celebrated a lot of the cameo milestones along the way with some of the films that were shot here in the valley, uh, Elvis's Wild in the Country, uh, a very serious film, of course, was shot partway at the Ink House. They used the cameo as the dance hall in, in that film, but no pictures of it. Um, and then, of course, Pollyanna, and we played that in Lyman Park a few, uh, on, on that year. So there's, there's been so much rich history. I know after it was G&G, &G, then it um, became the Liberty for a little while, and then the Roxy, and then the Liberty, and then the Cameo. And a lot of people, um, uh, John and Angie, right? Is it John and Angie Aguila that were, yes. Thank you. Uh, I've had so many people tell me the stories about uh, them when they were the proprietors of the cameo. So many of you, if you may remember that she had a flashlight that looked like you're bringing in a jet plane and she would escort you to the seat if the lights had gone down, but she also used that to go in the theater if you were caught kissing or holding hands mm -hmm. and she was very serious. She was a serious woman. I have had so many people tell me this serious story. Um, and then John would stand down there and he would, he would tell you to pick up your trash, you treat this like it's your living room, and then he'd go roll them and they'd start the film. So, you know, we have the flashlight. It is in a little case. It's in the lobby going towards the ladies' room. So I hope that sometime you go and check it out. It may bring back memories for uh, some of you. I know that Rick Henry and his wife had their very first date at the Cameo Cinema. I've had a lot of people share their stories along the way, which has made it 
so wonderful for me to take on this little piece of history. St. Helena is an incredible town, but the cameo to me is the heart of this town. And throughout the years, I've, I've kept some mementos. I actually took a, a few notes, which I never do. Um, but when I, when I came here, and I came here in 2005, I, I went to the movies never as a little kid, rarely as a little kid, oldest of nine. Mm -mm, there wasn't any um, nickels, quarters, or dimes to go to the theater. But there was a little theater when I was in uh, junior high and high school that was run by a husband and wife single screen theater and their daughter did the concessions and um, he escorted the movies and he only did G movies and he only did them on Friday and Saturdays never on Sundays so that was a small town experience when I was growing up and then you have kids life goes on and when I moved here um, I didn't know what I was going to do and the uh, theater Charlotte uh, lease was up and it was up for sale and um, a friend at the time, Sean LaRue, had mentioned it, and I said, let's buy it. I didn't know what I was doing. It is seriously the hardest, most complicated job of my life, but also the most rewarding. So I think I have a little of the yin and a little of the yang. Um, so I bought the theater in 2008, January 1st, 2008, from Charlotte. At that time, it was all film. And film, if you know anything about it, came in huge cans. They're 40 to 55 pounds each can. And usually you had two, sometimes three of those. And they would come in the middle of the night. You'd have to go in in the day, and you'd have to splice them together. Huge platters. In fact, I should donate one to your museum. Huge platters, three of them. The projector was, by the end, that time, a 32 millimeter. You had to run it across the room through this maze of levers and gadgets and everything else and back across to the platter. You had a hope to God that it was in all of the sprockets. You also had to make sure that it was all put together with the sound all the same. And when you're looking at film for a movie, there's a tiny little black line that's your sound line. And if you, I remember putting a movie together and halfway through, the people go vroom, 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 and they go backwards because that one reel I put on upside down and backwards. <laughs> it, it flies off this uh, platter. I never burned it up. I, I am, I'm proud of that. There were all these war pieces from Charlotte taped to the wall when I bought the theater. But it was complicated, and it was. And then you'd stay up at the end of the night, after the last show, and you had to break it all down. You had to put it back in the cans, put it out back for a delivery guy to come and, and take it. Who is Charlotte? Charlotte Wagner. So, very good question. I'm, I made the assumption everybody knew the history, but you don't. So, uh, Charlotte bought the theater in 1996 or seven. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't even paying attention to your slides. Okay, wait a minute, stay down that slide. I'm so sorry. So, that's the Kings of the Forest, that's the Sealing Company, uh, the wild animal sensation. So, this was a story about um, a, a man and a woman who, I don't think they were in love, but they got married, and they went in a wagon train, crossed the plains, and they encountered tigers. That's why I'm saying it was a weird movie. And, um, and they had a little girl, and they lost the little girl. It, it is a crazy story. And then it burned up, so I don't know what the ending is. But they had not only this poster, but this was the original one sheet, which is what they call them, that was the poster with the big lion's head. It wasn't a lion, though. Um, it was, it was, I guess it was a female lion. It wasn't a male lion that they used in the actual film. So how you get lions on an American prairie, I have no idea, but that was the original story. Um, and it, and it played, that was the opening film on May 15th, 1913 in a theater that now seats 140. There were 300 people and 100 people standing. 400 people must have come 
from miles and miles and miles away to be there for the opening night of this film. This is what the theater looked like. You'll see that there was not a marquee originally, but it is still this spot right here, and there were still stores on both sides like there is today. I believe Charlotte put the marquee on. I'm not sure. It might have been the person before. Paul Stokey. Paul Stokey. Paul Stokey. That's it. Okay. So that's when the marquee went up. And then she added the lights so you could read what the movies were. And then, is anybody on the city council or anything here? Okay. I'll tell you a secret. So. <laughs> When I bought the theater, if you remember, it says Cameo. And you probably don't remember this, but there weren't any lights on that Cameo part. I thought that was ridiculous. But I decided that I would say a mea copa, mea copa, mea copa. And I had my brother-in-law at the time who was visiting, and I got up during the day, and we hot glued Christmas lights up there to see if we'd have to take them down from the city. It went on for about a year or so. Nobody said anything. So when it was time to do a remodel, we had a Valley Electric put in those nice lights that are now trailing. So please don't tell on me. Um, it just made sense. So that's how it came. There were lots of uh, fun things that happened. They had vaudeville acts. I know they had the MGM lion that came to town. They had bears, on, live bears on the stage as well. They said it had a green room, and I'm not sure where that was because there is a storage room behind the screen today, but I don't know how that would have been configured as a green room. So I'm not sure about that. Um, but I love the cartoons and what, what they have to put up about the Liberty Two Nights Only. And oh, that reminds me, when it was the Liberty, they had playbills that looked like this. And I have lots of these that were donated to me. In fact, I can donate some of those to you. Janice, could you remind me of that? Thank you. But you know what's interesting? They played two and three movies a week at the Cameo. And that, I think, is fascinating. On Sundays was a Black Stallion. On Mondays um, was Gallipoli. I don't even know what that is. Then the Duelists, and then it was being there. It, they just had so many movies that were playing. And they would have this little printed out thing, much like our calendar today. However, it's a lot smaller. And if some of you remember, we used to mail you the calendars. When Charlotte was here, she mailed these calendars out. That was about $200 every time we mailed out the calendars. So I decided that it really wasn't worth the expense, especially now that you have them online that you can do. But there's been changes along the way. Oh, there's our little MGM lion when he came to town. I would have loved to have seen that. but. We have had big cats on our stage, though, so not to be outdone by the MGM Lion. We have done the Family Film Festival um, for 10 years, and we, have we had large cats from a wildlife preserve so that kids could see those, along with um, other animals, um, some birds of prey who have pooped on the stage, um, which the kids love, by the way. Anytime that happens, there's lots of cheers. <laughs> Interesting that this movie um, played in 1940. This, uh, the first um, actual talking film was The Jazz Singer that some of you know uh, about. But we are going to do one of our things that we're working on is doing a retrospective of the past 100 years and selecting a movie from every 10 years. And this was my movie selection for 1940s, and I didn't even know it had played at the cameo till I read the history from our historical society. Then it went to the Roxy. See, now you can see that it has the Roxy now and not the cameo, but it still has that marquee. So somewhere in there, and I don't know what year the marquee was put on. I have no idea. I don't know if it's in our notes. <laughs> this is just showing um, some of the films that, uh, oh yeah, The Earth is Mine is there. In our lobby, you'll notice, and in the bathrooms, we do have some posters that were found in the theater 
when it was renovated. There is a uh, lithograph that's going into the theater on the right side that's an oil painting of a one sheet of a movie with no date on it and it has like a burn hole in it. But we have wonderful um, posters about films that were filmed in the valley as well as ones that connect to the industry. We're kind of north, north Hollywood up here in, in Napa Valley. Another picture. This is inside the theater. There's a lot of people inside the theater, and I don't know, we all must have been smaller then because I can't see doubling the size of that theater in that space we're in now. And nobody wants to give up the love seats. Another picture of, of what it was, the Roxy in the town. You can still see it's, it's not a whole lot has changed. Oh yeah. So, this is why we don't know if we are the oldest continuously run movie theater. There were times in its history where it closed. Um, there was a little feud between who was running the theater and the owners of the building. There's been renovations. I know when Charlotte bought the theater, she closed for nine months to do a renovation. Um, I've been told that the floors were wooden at that time and that you would fall through the floors and that the seats were broken. So we have been closed and I know that um, they were going to build a second theater at one point in time and that never happened. So it's only the, the cameo in St. Helena. It was closed for a number of years after the Apple was retired. Be, be, what, was it like three years? Maybe. Yeah, see, that's what I don't know 100%. Late 70s? Late 70s, yeah. When the whole started showing movies in his barn on Spring Street because there was no cinema in town and he invited the public and it was a See, this is why we have this, to fill in the holes. I knew it was closed for a while, and most of the cinemas that are of our age or younger have, have closed for a number of years during the run, but it's never been anything other than a movie theater. So that's why we, we don't know the, the true answer if we are the oldest or one of them. Oh, yeah. Okay, go back one. Okay, go back one. was asking who was Charlotte. Yeah, well, I haven't got to Charlotte yet. Okay. Oh, here she is. I didn't recognize Charlotte. <laughs> so sorry. Sorry, Charlotte. Okay, Charlotte Wagner. So Charlotte decided to... Um, take on the renovations and the owning, owning of the theater in 1996 and 97 was the renovation. It was closed for nine months. At that point in time, she put in all new seats. Um, she put in a new screen, new curtains. There was always um, some soundproofing down the sides, but she took it down to the studs and the bare walls and did the renovation. She put in the ceiling, the um, tin ceiling, much to what it was when it opened. It was not Art Deco. Art Deco came after Art Nouveau. It's Art Nouveau, which, there's no pictures if it had a tin ceiling, so it might have been in her research that she assumes that it had. I, I don't know the answer because Art Nouveau was very clean lines. It was grays, it was metallic, it was, um, you know, some brass in that, but it, it wasn't as, um, I don't want to say gaudy, but uh, it was different than what uh, Art Deco was. So she went and she restored it to pretty much what it is today, except for there was still an interior box office. And I took that box office out. Everybody has to put their stamp on it. I bought the theater from Charlotte. Charlotte put it up for sale in uh, 2007. There were a lot of people that were putting together uh, nonprofit groups and were trying to buy it. But here comes a kid that moved from Michigan and thought, wow, this sounds like fun. And um, somehow I convinced Charlotte and um, Mrs. Money that um, it would be a good idea to sell it to me. And so they did. And Charlotte worked with us um, and myself for well over a year. She was available whenever anything happened, and I called her up in a panic, and she was great. She still comes to the movies at the Cameo. 
Um, and that brings me to 2007 at the end of the year when Sean and I were learning the business and it was um, um, film at that point in time. We officially took our start date on January 1st, 2008. Um, and um, it was within a year that, um, and at that time they were doing art films. Charlotte, Charlotte's interest was in indie art films. And so it was what the theater was for a number of years. And a lot of times the attendance was minimal to none. So um, when Sean and I took it on, he's very much an indie art film person. I am, however, you've got to pay the bills. So we decided to do a combination. And at that time, we, um, with the help of Mark and Dana Johnson, who loved uh, the foreign films, we did a Wednesday night art film. And um, then at that time, the um, new digital projectors were coming out because upstairs there was a tiny little projector that we'd put a DVD in and it would have to throw all the way to the front of the house and it was difficult to say the least. So um, I went to the LA market and um, I picked out a $120,000 digital projector at its time and came back and Mark and Dana said, well, how much do you need? And I told them what we needed and they we wrote a grant and they were the donors, Cantus Foundation was the donors for the very first digital projector. So that was in 2009 and, and this little theater has stayed on the cutting edge of theaters around the world because we were one of the first theaters that had a digital projector of that magnitude here, unheard of in a little town. And then quickly, and the reason for this is the studios didn't want to do film anymore. It was very expensive um, to ship it. They'd have to make more and more prints. If somebody listened to Francis speak at The Godfather, he explained a little bit about that. And um, so they were really pushing a digital projector. So they were going to eliminate all film within two years. And what happened was, because of that grant, we had ours installed and we were ready, where a lot of little theaters, single screen, double screens and triples, closed or had to go out and do fundraising and try to convert, which was so difficult. We didn't have any of those headaches. The headache we had was everything was still film and then one movie would come digital. So for two years, I would be doing both. You'd have the 35 millimeter and then you'd have the digital. And I'm still smiling and I'm still standing, but I couldn't wait till it, didn't, it wasn't digital. And what digital means, it comes in the shape of an eight track. It slips into a drive in your projector and you download it into the projector and then hit play. Isn't that nice? <laughs> You don't get the click, click, click. Everybody goes, oh, I missed that. No, you don't. You just thought you did. You don't see those burn marks or green lines on the screen from the film burning or spliced together or hiccups like this. Every now and then, yes, it does go down. Um, but for the most part, it simplified everything and the ability to get wonderful content. So that happened. Um, uh -oh. Yeah, okay, we're gonna, hold, we're gonna hold that one for a minute. So then once that happened um, and we had the digital projector, then I thought, well, why can't we stream things? What's wrong with that? So we decided to put a satellite dish on the roof and that's how we were able to do the Oscars. That's how we were able to do the Royal Wedding. That's how we were able to do um, Obama's inauguration. That's how we do the World Cup, the soccer games. We can stream those in real time live, which again, raised the bar up for the cameo. Um, and then a few years after that, and I'll talk about some of the programs that we did, I went again to Las Vegas to the show, and I don't go every year because it's mind boggling. And um, the people who had helped Charlotte put in the 32 millimeter projector, then put in our digital projector. And by the way, they learned right along with us how to put it in and how it worked. So then I was at the show and I heard the Atmos sound. And the Atmos stands for atmosphere. 
So we started out with just sound coming out of the front of a, a movie theater. And then Dolby came up with surround sound. And that took it to nine speakers that went around a movie house of our size. Atmos made it, meant it went everywhere. It's in the ceiling. And we went to 21 speakers. That's a huge difference. So I heard Atmos in a theater in Las Vegas as a premiere. I, I went over to our people at the projector and I said, I want that. And they laughed. They fell on the floor laughing. They go, you're not going to have that. I go, I am, because we're going to turn 100, and I'm going to have it for our 100th birthday. So what they didn't know was we have a patron for the theater who sat on the Dolby board at that time. His name was Ted Hall. And his wife is Laddie. So being a smart woman, I go to Laddie, and I pitch it to her first. She primes the pump, so when I talk to Ted, he already knows what I want. Not only do I want the Atmos, and I want it for our birthday, I want it for free, and it's only going to eight theaters in the world at the time that I want it. <laughs> he said, okay, Kathy, let's put you in charge. Let's have you talk to the CEO. So I do, I pitch it, and I go, you know, you can't always go to the big guy. Sometimes you've got to go to the little guy. And you're in San Francisco, and you can use my theater and promote your Atmos all you want. They never did. Um, so lo and behold, we got the Atmos. It was for free, which was a $30,000 piece of equipment. We did a capital campaign to renovate the theater for its 100th birthday. Um, but what I didn't know was that didn't include the speakers for the Atmos. So then my uh, projection people said, well, Kathy, you can't put in JBLs. And JBLs, by the way, who know sound, which I didn't know anything about, are what all theaters have, except for people who are in the business who have a private theater or the Dolby sound room. What they have are Meyer speakers. They are the Rolls Royce of speakers. Wow. Why can't we have the Rolls Royce of speakers? <laughs> How about they're five times as expensive? I go, yes, but we're the little guy. So we speak to Mr. and Mrs. Meyer, and we have our foundation. We don't get them for free. But we got them for twice as much as JBL speakers. And so the Cameo, not only does it have the Atmos sound, but it has the Rolls Royce of speakers. This theater is unlike any screening room in the country, if not the world. And now we have a laser projector, which we put in in 2013. No, what year did we put that in? What year is this? No, we put that in just before COVID. Um, and I was very fortunate. The cameo is full of magic. And I say that I'm in Oz. Uh, we knew we were going to have to do a capital campaign because the projector was old. It was a first generation and parts weren't available anymore. And um, right at Christmas, I'll never forget, an anonymous person who lived here, they don't live here anymore, called me up and they said, Kathy, what do you need for the cameo? I go, I need a new projector. Well, what do you want? How much does it cost? Okay. So I didn't go the most expensive, but I did go to a laser projector, and it was a quarter of a million dollars. There were six in the world, and we ordered it, and it came from the Netherlands, um, and it's a Dolby, um, and it was uh, 900 pounds we had to get up the stairs at the Cameo. And they installed it. Nobody knew how it worked including Dolby. Um, so it took a while to get the bugs out because also where they were installing it in the few theaters around the world did not have the Atmos sound. So it didn't understand how to communicate with our caliber of sound. So it took about a year, a lot of crying to get it done. And now we have people that can help fix us remotely. I'd call them up, they go in remotely and I don't know what the next generation looks like for the theater, but I know that it's, it's been so wonderful that we've been able to have speakers and filmmakers, 
Um, we create special events, our cinema bites. We, we try to include all kinds of organizations. The farmer's market, we just had Francis Coppola, we've had Eleanor, we've had um, Roman, um, we've had them all on our stage. And it doesn't happen without the magic of the movie. So when people say, you know, they're not coming to the movies anymore. I tell them better come to the theater during Top Gun because people are back. Um, but it is the magic. It's the, it's the heart of hearing people laugh, hearing them sigh, listening to a, you know, you connect in, in, from the senses. And to me, you can't get that sitting at home, watching it on your computer or in your, in your living room. The magic of the movies is here to stay. And I think that with our history, we're rich with history. I've been doing this now for 14 and a half years. I think I'm the longest running proprietor for the cameo. I don't think there is anybody else um, that's been here long enough. I'm looking for the next generation that wants to step up and take the wheel because now with the way that our world is and what access we have to live events in that, the interactive, the uh, immersion part of it, I'm excited to see where we go with the movies and what comes next. But this theater is so rich in history and all the programs that we've started. Recently, I've had a few complaints, but I have thick skin. We had our, some of our staff that works for us, and they're um, Hispanic, and they said, Kathy, can you do movies for some of our friends and family? Can you do Spanish subtitles? So, yes, we can. So I made the decision that on Tuesday nights and Friday nights at the 745, the movies have Spanish subtitles. We have an older demographic that comes to the movies, and I had a lot of people ask for open captions. I said, okay, we'll do two days a week of that. So we have something for everyone, and if you come to a movie and it's open caption and it's not something you like, then come to a different show, because what we're trying to do is what the cameo's always done. It's for all, all ages, all demographics, all walks of life. And I think right now we have that opportunity that we can connect with everyone. I probably missed a lot, so if you have questions, I'll try to answer them. Okay. Oh, I got one more thing. Okay, go ahead. So you, the name change usually happens when somebody changes the theater. That's kind of the tradition. So G&G, &G, then Liberty, then Roxy, then Liberty, and Charlotte did Cameo. When I bought the theater, I thought of Bijou. It was going to be the jewel box. But I like the Cameo. It's a Cameo appearance. And I want to explain the logo. I worked with Barry Lowe. Some of you may know Barry Lowe. And he asked a lot of questions about what, what, did, what was I looking for? What did it mean to me? And I said, I want to convey the power of story, the sending it out with the movies and the receiving it back from people that tell stories, the storytellers from individuals to filmmakers. So he came up with that androgynous logo. And by the way, the androgynous started out with probably a double D. I don't know if I should say that. Uh, but I went, oh, no, no, no. I, I don't want it to be male or female. I, can have long hair, but I want the hand out, and it's sending out a star, and it's receiving the star. You don't know if it's receiving or sending, but that's what it means. It means the magic of the power of story. And so I think that logo really represents who the cameo is today, and that's why the foundation was created. You gave your plug, so I think I better give my plug here. The foundation was started in 2012, and because of the people who made the donations for the projector and then the capital campaign. We're a small town. Unless we're full or 50% full at every show, every time we're open, it doesn't support itself. But with little donations and big donations, we are able to continue to thrive 
keep staff on, we never furloughed staff, and bring in guest speakers and programs for all of us to enjoy. So for me, the Cameo is a hybrid. It's a combination of our foundation and the Cameo itself. It's a, it's a community that is woven together with that tapestry of that little movie theater. That's the end of my story. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> and um, are there any questions? Yes. I always wonder why the films caught on fire. Oh, because the um, chemicals where they w that they put the film together with um, was very flammable. Now the old films that were 16 millimeter burned up all the time and burnt down lots of movie theaters. It's like Cinema Paradiso. But then they, they treated them, and I'm not sure in what year, 19, I don't know, I don't know what year it was, that they, they changed the chemical part, but the reason they still would burn up after that was because these little teeny sprockets, that if you think of the, you know, the gears that have sprockets, there's little holes on either side of the film. Well, it just takes it to skip one, then it gets stuck. And when it gets stuck, the lamps for the um, uh, film to be projected through are so hot that after that, it wasn't flammable, but it would melt. And you would see the film melting on the screens. It happened when Charlotte was the owner on a number of occasions. You just see it just kind of melting and then everything would shut down. So I never burned up a piece of film. <laughs> but I did miss the sprockets and throw it all over the place. So um, that's why digital also makes more sense. You don't have to, um, you don't have the flaws that you had in film, which people got used to, but your eyes and your ears, they want it, they, they, you see and imagine something else, so you want it to be as clear and as concise. The sound is really, I, I wasn't a sound person until I got involved with the cameo. And now I can tell if it's, if, if it's not playing out of all the speakers, you may not know it, but I do. And um, so that's been things. My kids won't go to the movies with me. Uh, you know, um, when I go to other theaters, I have a meltdown most of the time, so I try not to. Do you still have a protectionist? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, but my staff has learned how to slide that disc in and, and convert it. And um, Chris Vance, who graduated from PUC, and he is um, the head of the tech department up there, he now can go in remotely. Um, but they keep complicating life for me a little bit. So now the films, before they would just come and you'd, you'd transfer it over. Now because of Atmos and our sound, you have this file and this file and this file, and you're doing subtitles and you're doing Spanish subtitles, and you have to ingest them in order. If you don't, it doesn't play right. So we're learning. But I do have a few staff members that can do it. They now know more than I do. They know how to change a hard drive. That's not my, my forte. <laughs> Anyone else? Yep. So speaking of the, the financial health of the financial health of the life of the cinema and the future, is there an endowment? I mean, how can we assure that the Kenya will That's a great question. <laughs> so Anna is on our board, and we fundraise every year. And you know, yep, gas prices have gone up, so the cost of supplies has gone up, the cost of minimum wage has gone up, everything has gone up, but you know, the Cameo keeps the movie tickets at $10. And there's a reason why, I can't even tell you how many people say, Boo, raise your ticket. I won't do it, here's why I won't do it. The studios, when I started, took 35% of the box office for every movie. Today, Disney, Warner Brothers, take 68% of your box office. 68 cents on every dollar. I'll be darned if I'm increasing our ticket price a dollar to give them 68 cents. 
please donate to the Cameo because then it goes directly to it. And I want everybody to be able to afford it. I want a, a family of four to be able to come to the movies, bring their own bowl, that was my idea, get their popcorn in that. But the financial livelihood of the theater every year starts over. It takes about $350,000 a year in donations to keep everything running. After we pay the studios and everything, that's about what it takes. We've been very lucky, very blessed that, especially during COVID, um, people realized how important it was. And what I say, I'm here till the community says, it's not for us anymore. So hopefully that doesn't come on my watch. So that's the answer. Kathy, if, I can, if I can just say, yes. that we send out um, our appeal in August, and so if you see it, if you know it, share it with your friends, because it does, if everybody gives some, mm -hmm. it makes it possible. I mean, it's, and also the Giving Tuesday. And we do good Giving Tuesday. Tuesday. But even before Giving Tuesday, you know, it's great for us, especially, I'll just be perfectly honest, especially in an election year, because people start to focus, and also fire season. fires happen in fire season, so if people can give a little well, we're going to do a, a fundraising event August 19th, so it's on our website, but we haven't pushed it out a lot. We're about to do that. In my day, storytelling it from the, for a cameo, and oh, you found another slide I forgot about. So during COVID, I'll go back to where we're going with the fundraiser. During COVID, people were crazy, so I said, let's do a pop-up drive-in. And the city of St. Helena contributed and our foundation, and we bought this screen. That screen was a $20,000 investment. I still have it. It's about to go up at Farmstead on the 12th. And we started drive-in movies. Uh, we started out um, when everything was closed down. We were at Gotts. We only had that little back lot, but we, and we did it four nights a week, and we were jam-packed, which was great. And then last summer we did it at Krug, but we couldn't do weekends. We could only have a weekday. We did the Geyserville or Geyser property a couple of times, and now we're partnering with Farmstead to do it on the lawn. But you know, the people that were able to come, people that had compromised immune system and that, and, and they had their masks, we had our masks, they could pre-order popcorn, we'd check them in and hand it. It was so much fun. I gotta say it was fun. Hotter than Billy, you know, on some nights to be there, standing there and getting your screen up. But Krug and Gotts were so supportive of that. I think this one's at Gotts and this one's at Krug. So that was a much easier lot to park cars in. Um, so we decided, so go back to storytelling. In the beginning, there were vaudeville acts. You saw that from the cameo when it was the GND. And burlesque was a form of storytelling. It's been part of the movies. And I was asked by one of my board members, Kelly, what's something you always wanted to do? I'm on a burlesque show. So we are doing a live burlesque, but we took it outside the cameo because the CIA is working with us and we're doing it in their barrel room. It's a swanky speakeasy kind of place. We have an internationally known burlesque artist named Frankie Fictitious and she's going to perform. And a local DJ who's done bottle rock and winery events called DJ Rotten Robbie, so you can dance the night away, will be serving wine all night, appet past appetizers, a dessert bar, and it's just a fun night to come out, and it is a $250 ticket, but $150 is tax deductible. So that ends on a Friday night, August 19th, and I'm going to get to see my live burlesque, so I'm very excited about that. You had another slide for me? Or I know we got a question here. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Nope, that's there. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about the distribution system? How do you get films? It seems like we used to have to wait when I was a kid to wait a long time for a new film, but you got new films like right away. What, what, how do you get a film? If my booking agent was here right now, he would cry. I beat him up. And every year it is harder and harder because the studios, the big studios, keep moving the arrow. Used to be that a studio like, or a theater like us 
we could have a movie two weeks after it opened for a week to play. Because a lot of you know you like to come to the movies sometimes more than once a week. Um, now, um, we're on what we call tier three. So San Francisco, LA, New York, Chicago, they're tier one. Sonoma, because they have more theaters there, are tier two, and I'm tier three. So I have to play uh, the Rubik's Cube game every month because I have a list of movies I want. And sometimes I only want a movie for four days so that I can move on to another one for you guys. Um, but the studios tie my hands with that. And so then I have to look at, okay, what's for, what will appeal to the majority of our audience? And I start working on next month's movies the month before. And sometimes I don't get permission till four days before it's going to play, which is hard because you all want the calendar. So do I. Um, so a movie like Top Gun, I knew I'd take it on opening day. I knew I'd have to have it for two weeks, but I wasn't too worried about it. And I knew I was going to pay this time 68 cents on the dollar for that movie. However, I'm packed. I've never sold so many hot dogs in my life at the movie theater. Wine, beer, candy. So I look at that as a plus for it. Um, Jurassic World, it's a summer. That, that movie is going to, for 4th of July, is a bigger hit for more of the community than Elvis. So I had to make the decision to move Elvis out a couple weeks and pray to the gods that the people can wait two weeks, not have to go down to the other place, we never mention their name, and wait for the cameo to have it. But distribution is really tough. I have a booking agent, and I have to go through the booking agent. Yeah. But now filmmakers, some filmmakers come to me. It's just if I can fit them in and, and that. Oh, I'll tell you another thing that happens nowadays. Whew, I got a lot to say. In distribution, the rules have changed again. When I have a Disney movie or a Warner Brothers movie, they say I cannot market our film class. Even though that's not a day I do movies, film class has nothing to do I can't market the drive-in, supposedly. I'm waiting for me to be told I can't do it right now. I'm still selling tickets. Anything that doesn't showcase their movies, they hold me to a different standard than a multiplex. And that is a hard thing. And it, it, it doesn't affect their bottom line at all. But there's no, there's no adjusting. And, and by the way, we are fortunate up here in Napa Valley. The CEO of Disney built a house up here. And his wife is on a fire committee. And I've met him more than once. He, I think he sees me and turns the other way because I have pitched him the little guy on more than one occasion. Um, but, and he comes, he comes to the movies. So, you know, I don't know how they can, after COVID, not think outside the box for change. And they have with streaming, but they haven't in how they set up their distribution. But it's coming. I'm going to outsmart them yet. I just haven't figured it out. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to do that. I'm trying. I just have a feeling. Will you mention June 19th? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I'm going, June 19th. What's on June 19th? June 19th. So one of the things that happened a few years ago, the Sloan Foundation, which you may not know the Sloan Foundation by name, but PBS is sponsored by the Sloan Foundation. They're a big contributor to that. And they have a program called Science on Screen that they do with in partnership with the Coolidge Theater out of Boston. And they give grants out to theaters to create science programs tied to the movies. So it's been five years ago we learned about this grant and Stacy Bresler and I created a program and we sent it in and we were given the grant. We were the smallest theater in size by half. And we were one of the first theaters in California that received the grant. And we now do, um, depending on the grant, three to four programs a year. And we're able to bring in scientists and speakers. And it's so amazing what we've been able to accomplish. So. June 19th, Father's Day, is our final in this year's Science on Screen. We'll start back up again in the fall. 
Um, and we are doing an incredible film that came out during COVID and didn't get to play at the theater called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Some of you may have seen it, but it's coming to the big screen. It's a true story of a young uh, boy in Africa whose school didn't have water and his village didn't have water. And they built a windmill to give, bring water up from the ground for both the village and the school. And uh, we have Beth Milliken and, um, I just went blank, Anna, from uh, Napa Green. Um, is her name Anna? Who is going to be speaking, and they're going to speak on climate. They're going to speak on the Napa Valley, water, land, you know, where we are with drought. So it's, a, it's all so timely to tie it all together. And we're so lucky that in the Bay Area, we have experts on just about anything you can think of. So they're going to be here on Sunday, June 19th at 1 o'clock. We'll do the movie and a Q&A to follow. And it's a $10 ticket. So it is a value. So I hope you mark that on your calendar and get your tickets. Was that what you wanted? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, guys. On behalf of the board and the uh, Historical Society, thank you for being like you. You're welcome. And see you at the movie. Oh, there's a book up here if you want to kind of look through some of our 100-year anniversary stuff that um, we put together, a little scrapbook if anybody's interested. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you.